Oh Lord, you are great. You are greater than any can measure. You, in fact, measure the universe by the span. And we thank you that you are bigger than everything, that you are stronger than everything, and that we who take refuge in you truly have everything. Lord, we are amazed when we think that you would look upon us, that you would give attention to our plight, to our puny frames, that you would pay attention to our lives and our ways. And we are astounded that you would, in your kindness, love us. Thank you, O Lord. We ask as we look to your word tonight that you, by your Holy Spirit, would shape us, that we might think about ourselves and about the universe and about you the way that you want us to. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I would invite you this evening to turn to my favorite psalm, Psalm 8. It's at least in the top 150. I love this psalm, and I think you're going to learn a lot about yourself this evening from this song in the songbook of Israel. Let's read it together. Psalm 8, for the choir director, according to the Gittith, a psalm of David. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You display your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have established strength because of your enemies to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have established, what is man that you remember him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God. And you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the animals of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This psalm, like many of the psalms, has an ascription at the top. That's part of the text. For the choir director, on the Gittith, a psalm of David. For the choir director indicates to us, once again, this is a song to be sung. Uh, It is a song to be sung with planning and with skill and with coordination. Somebody is going to stand up in the congregation and lead this song, and the people are going to sing it together. On the Gittith, uh, I don't know what a Gittith is. Uh, I don't think anybody alive today knows what the Gittith is. It apparently is a musical instrument. But the three places it shows up in Scripture indicate that it is a happy instrument. So far in the Psalms, we've had a wisdom psalm in the beginning, and then we've had these sort of sad psalms that drive us to sort of a despair and a turn and faith. And those have been sort of laments or, or even penitential in their flavor This one is just praise. This one is just celebration. And so this gittith, whatever this instrument is, is a musical instrument that was played when the the wine presses were full or at the Feast of Booths. Those are the other two locations. So this is a a happy celebration. Uh, This is sort of a a party instrument. Uh, This song is upbeat in contrast to the ones we've sung in the songbook so far. What is this psalm all about? It is all about God's glory. I want you to notice the bookends, verse 1 and verse 9 in our English text. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Verse 9, O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Two identical verses. And those serve as a bookend to everything that's in between. And it gives us the the theme of the psalm. And everything else in the psalm builds outward to this theme. What's fascinating about this psalm is it begins and ends with the majesty of Yahweh or the glory of the Lord. And everything else in between is kind of about the glory of man. It's an interesting juxtaposition and it drives us towards the theology 
of this psalm. It's going to drive us to the theology of ourselves. It's going to drive us to the theology of, of what it means to be human. And John Calvin said, the, the most important things you need to know are God and yourself. You need to know who God is and you need to know who you are. This psalm addresses both of those in significant measure. The song is about the glory of God and we will see God's glory in humanity's small scale and regal role. Man is puny and he has a big job. And all of that brings glory to the one who designed us. That's what the psalm is all about. Look at verse 1. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You display your splendor above the heavens. The psalm begins with Yahweh. That is, again, the covenant name of God, the personal name of God. God is his title. Yahweh is his name. And his name is built off of the the to be verb in Hebrew. It indicates that God is self-existent. He didn't come into existence. Nobody made him. He just is. He always is. He always has been ising. He just never did not exist. He is self-existent. And there's no one like him just on the basis of his self-existence. And this self-existent God who needed nothing, created for his own purposes, for his own glory. And this name Yahweh is the name that he gave to his people when he entered into covenant relationship with them. He said, I'm going to set my love upon you and I'm going to make promises to you. And every time we see in the English text, all capitals L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's what's indicated. The self-existent covenant keeping God of Israel. Yahweh. And notice the song goes out, O Yahweh, our Lord. Our here is a collective. David's not just saying, my God. He's saying, our Lord. And so the idea here is a a congregational, collective relationship to God that is personal. This possessive pronoun, our Lord, means we belong to him and he to us. Again, this is built on God's grace that he would enter into relationship with his people. And it is the great privilege of humanity to have a relationship with the God who made us. And then he says, O Yahweh, our Lord. In the English text, uh, oftentimes you see, O Lord, our Lord. Those are two different words. The second word, Lord, notice it's not in all capital letters. It is just the word for a Lord or a master or someone who is in charge. So, O Yahweh, our Lord, is how the psalm opens. And then he says, how majestic is your name? That's not a question. O Lord, how majestic is your name? No, how majestic is your name is an exclamation. In other words, it goes beyond words of expression to describe the majesty of the name of Yahweh. The word majesty or majestic is used to describe the vast and mighty waters of the sea in Psalm 93. It is used to describe a a great and mighty ship in Isaiah 33 or a magnificent tree in Ezekiel 17. Throughout the Old Testament, this word for majesty is used of kings and nations and people of nobility. And here, David says, O Yahweh, our Lord... How majestic is your name? Think about that. David, as king, having as much earthly majesty as one could imagine, joins himself with the hoi polloi, the commoners, and says, Yahweh is majestic. David, the king here, is deflecting from his own noble position and pointing to the one of infinite nobility, infinite majesty in God. And this is great. This view of the majesty of God levels all of humanity. We find ourselves very small and very low before the glorious God. And notice he says, how majestic is your name? The name of God is is a way to capture the sum total of who he is. Names are very important in your Bible. Uh, Recognize how often people were named with a specific purpose. It had to go along with a story. God's name represents his being, his character, his attributes, who he is. And and David ascribes this majesty to God's name, everything that God is. And this majesty or glory or splendor is to be seen in all the earth. 
It's kind of like Psalm 19 when it says, the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh, the, the glory of God. That is, just by their bare existence, they scream out that God is glorious. Romans 1 tells us that his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen being understood from what has been made. It is like all of creation just screams out, God is glorious. You can think about what this means in all the earth. Maybe you think of places that are well tracked. There, there are tourist attractions people go to and, and they see famous places. You, you can go into the, the Swiss Alps on the French-Swiss-Italian border and, and you can get up at the top of these mountains and look over Mont Blanc and you can say, wow, this is glorious. God did this. Lots of people go there. Zion National Park draws tourists from all over the world every year. You can dive on coral reefs that lots of people have seen. You can go to these well-tracked places and know that God is glorious. But you can also go to places unexplored. Consider the sights that are yet unseen on this little marble in space that is our home. Now, we have not yet explored everything there is to see here. There are many things that human eyes have, have never yet beheld, where God's glory is on display nonetheless. You think about the deep sea creatures and, and all of those things that God made that have only been seen in the last few decades, and there are still many yet to be discovered. All of them displaying God's glory. Think for a moment just about the nooks and crannies in our own state. I read Psalm 8.1 and, and I see God's majesty in his name all in all the earth. And, and if I just stop and think, in all of Arizona, there's too much to tell. Have you been on the top of four peaks in a thunder blizzard? You know, when you get a whiteout snowstorm and the lightning is hitting the mountain at the same time? Or have you been to Reservation Lake in, in the hot summer when it's cold and rainy up there? Have you seen all the trails and the wrinkles of the Superstition Mountains? Have you been to Lockett Meadow on the back of the San Francisco Peaks or Oak Creek Canyon or Havasu Falls? You know, you could spend a lifetime and not exhaust the Grand Canyon. Have you been in the Mazatzal Mountains? Or the top of Mount Lemmon? Have you been in the marshy grasslands and the forests of the White Mountains? Have you been to the volcanic cones and, and seen the buffalo herds of the high desert? You have to go to Saguaro National Park and Oregon Pipe National Monument. And I haven't yet been to Patagonia. That's a place in Arizona that's supposed to be of inestimable beauty. To see Horseshoe Bend and the Slot Canyons. And this is just Arizona. And, and I don't think anybody in Arizona has exhausted the bucket list of things that must be seen. Think about what it means that God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are seen through what he has made all over this globe. All of creation shouts his glory. And the next phrase goes farther. He displays his splendor above the heavens. And the Hebrew word for heavens accounts for the sky, our atmosphere. It accounts for space. And heaven accounts for the very throne room of God where God's manifest presence dwells. The place that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 with a throne and the four living creatures crying out, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And what is seen here in verse 1 is God's splendor is displayed above all of that. Above space, of the, above the very throne room of heaven where the angels are, beyond the universe. Do you remember when Solomon built the temple for God in Jerusalem? David had assembled the materials, Solomon put it all together, and it was one of the wonders of the ancient world. And at the dedication of the temple, Solomon said this before all the people, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I built. This magnificent monument 
glorious building, a, a, a wonderful uh, piece of architecture in the ancient world that would have dwarfed all the people that came to it. And Solomon says, this tiny little box can't hold you. The universe can't hold you. His splendor is above the heavens. That we see here God's transcendence. That just means he is infinitely beyond. Listen to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see the one who created these stars. The ones who lead forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Do you know how many stars there are? We don't. We make estimates. We make estimates from our vantage point on our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which if it is a spiral galaxy and we are out on that long end arm of that spiral galaxy and we can see other spiral galaxies and we can look back into the spaces we can't see and make an estimate at some 200 million stars in our own galaxy and multiply that by 200, did I say million? Billion, excuse me. Uh, multiply that by, two, no, it's million. Okay, the astronomers are going to be really upset. That's a big difference if you go millions or billions. Eric, do you know? <laughs> okay. And it's either 200 million or 200 billion. I think it's million. Other galaxies in the universe. And these numbers are too big to grapple with. And the Bible tells us God knows every star, placed every one, not one is out of place, and he knows them all by name. Staggering. Isaiah 45, 18 says, Thus says Yahweh, who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place. He formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am Yahweh and there's no one else. No one is like this God who put all these things into place. And what does He say about the earth? Given all the vastness of space, He says, I created the earth not to be a waste place which says something about Big Bang and a solar system that's four and a half billion years old and it cools from lava to eventually. No, God created it inhabited. From the first week of creation, this is what Isaiah says, he did not form it a waste place, he formed it to be inhabited. This gets at not only God's transcendence that he is infinitely beyond, but also his imminence, that he is near, that he is right at hand. He is everywhere and he has taken a special interest in this planet, our home where we dwell. How will this great, peerless, measureless, majestic God get glory for himself? According to this psalm, he'll get glory for himself through puny humans. He'll get glory through our very small scale and our regal role. We're puny, but we have a big job. Let's look first at our small scale. Look at verse 2. From the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. There are two groups of people listed in this verse. There are children described as infants and nursing babies. And then there are enemies. They're described as adversaries, enemies, and those who take revenge. This is an interesting verse because God is taking the weakest and the most vulnerable, the puniest of puny humanity to accomplish his purposes against the strong and the mighty, the vengeful, those he calls enemies. It is literally those who take up hostility against God. And I want you to see the way this verse is used in the New Testament. Turn to Matthew 21. This verse finds itself on the lips of our Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry. It is the week of his triumphal entry where he walks into the city. He walks into Jerusalem the week before he is crucified. And you remember that the week he's crucified, the mob shouts out, crucify him, crucify him. But just the week before, they cry out, praise God, he's here to save us. And we see the fickleness of the crowd in, in just a week's time. 
But look at Matthew 21. Verse 12. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. He's pointing out the hypocrisy of the bankrupt religious leadership. God has showed up at his own house and he's calling out the corrupt leaders. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the marvelous things which he had done and the children who were shouting in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And listen to the rebuke from the corrupt religious leadership. It's kind of like the grumpy old man. Children are to be seen and not heard, especially these ones. Because what are they heard saying? They're identifying this Jesus of Nazareth who's overturning the tables and calling out their hypocrisy. They're identifying him as the promised one, the son of David, the Messiah. And the children are saying it. And they're quoting the Old Testament to declare who this truly is. And so they rebuke Jesus. Do you hear what these children are saying? Get them to stop it is the implication. And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read? Come on, guys. Have you read your Bibles? These are the gatekeepers of spirituality. They're the ones who had the lock and key on the Bible. They, they told the people what the Bible meant according to their own thoughts. And Jesus calls them out on their understanding. He says, have you never read Psalm 8? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. And he left them and went out of the city. Now, what is Jesus doing with this verse with the religious hypocrites? He's declaring his own deity. He's saying, I am Yahweh about whom Psalm 8 sings. You're upset with the kids calling me the son of David? I'm here to tell you, I am the subject of David's song. And you guys are in a lot of trouble. Jesus uses this psalm. By saying, the mouths and infants and nursing babies are going to praise Yahweh. And then Yahweh is in their midst. And he quotes the psalm. And not only that, but because Psalm 8-2 establishes the ones to whom the infants cry out as enemies, adversaries, and revengeful. Jesus is indicting them, not only for rejecting who he is but for their sin as enemies of God through and through. What's fascinating here is Jesus uses the simple and the weak to silence the powerful. That is the thrust of Psalm 8 here, that, that God is going to use puny man to accomplish his purposes, even infants and babies to ordain praise for himself, to silence the enemies. And when Jesus was on the earth, he did that very thing. This is the principle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 1 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. You see, the God who gets glory from the brilliant fireballs of unexplored space and the towering spires of the Andes Mountains and the genius of double helix strands in a DNA molecule, that majestic God is pleased and glorified when little children in simple faith declare what is true. They declare what the sophisticated people of the world neglect or even suppress. If you're raising kids and, and maybe you're a, a first generation believer with unbelieving family or maybe even unbelieving parents, you, you may have had the experience of your kids saying the darndest things. <laughs> One of our kids wrote the most direct loving note to my unbelieving grandfather. Don't you know that if you don't believe in Jesus, you will go to hell? You should believe in him. I love you. Granddaughter, great granddaughter. 
When your kids evangelize family members, maybe you have been praying for extended family at home and the little kids pick up on that and, and then they take it upon themselves in bold sincerity to praise God. The sweet sincerity of straightforward faith actually glorifies the Lord and steps on toes. It was a child's song that led the very sophisticated Augustine to repentance in the fourth century. He was about 30 years old, very accomplished, had the world by its tail, was a lawyer, was a smarty pants, and it was a little kid's song. Take up the book and read. A little jingle sung within earshot. And he was convicted and went home and opened a Bible and read in the book of Romans, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh and surrendered to Christ. God uses the puny and the weak to bring down the wise and the strong. Look at verse 3 of Psalm 8. Here's David's contemplation. When I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established. Notice David says these are your heavens. You, you possess the universe. It belongs to you. Ownership by right of creation and the universe, according to David, is the finger work of God. You see that? We marvel at the beauty and the brilliant design. And, and for God, it is just finger work. He measures the entire cosmos by the span. Have you ever wondered why the universe is so large comparative to the size of the earth? I mean... If God's theological purposes are centered right here on this little blue marble hanging in space, why is the universe so big? Have you ever been troubled by the so-called problem of distant starlight? I mean, if light travels at 186,000 miles per second, and it takes thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years for light from distant stars to reach us, in fact, we wouldn't see it yet if they had blinked out 4 billion years ago, according to the time that light travels. Doesn't that make a problem for the age of the universe and the historical record of the Bible? Have you been troubled by that? Thankfully, Isaiah the prophet answers that. He says, God stretched out the heavens. The God who said, let light shine. He's the one who just commanded light to be, can create the stars and the photons in between us and them. And God designed light for the purposes that he set it there for. And I believe one of those purposes is for us to get a handle on just how big the universe is. How big is his finger work? And that gives us a glimpse, even though we don't really understand the math of the size of the universe, it makes no sense. But however big the universe actually is, if we could ever even conceive, he has it in the palm of his hands. He measures it by the span. God is bigger than all that. Notice David's word here. When I see, New American Standard says, when I consider. The idea is seeing the universe or, or whenever I see it. And let's take cues from David here. Look up, look out, look around you. Don't miss the opportunity. Watch Blue Planet. Uh, season one, two, and three, or whatever they're on, or, or planet Earth. And, and you can mute it. You don't need to listen to David Attenborough suppress the truth. But just watch and see what God has done. Take a hike, take a drive, go stargazing. David would have been out in the fields with no light pollution and seeing the stars. And when you see the, the panoply of stars, and, and maybe you can see the, the, the Milky Way, the, the, the faint hue of white that's up there that is just stars so small, you can't see the pinpoints of light, but there are so many of them, they create light that is visible. And if you have that as the backdrop, and then you get a meteorite, a, a shooting star, as we call it, coming through our own atmosphere, you sort of get a sense of distance better than just looking at a, a flat backdrop. And you say, wow, it's really big. Go to the mountains and feel small all over again. 
If you go to the ocean and you play in the waves and and you see the power and the beauty of ocean waves and just for a split second, you harness massive amounts of power or you ski down slopes, you, you just, you don't do those things without looking around you, without taking in and as David says, considering or seeing the heavens and the work of his fingers, the moon and the stars, take it all in. Just about every night we get a a painting in the western sky with these Arizona sunsets and a wide open horizon. And David asks in verse 4, what is man? It's a wonderful question. What are we? What are we doing here? What is our place in the universe? What is our purpose for existence? What is man? And here in verse 4, what is man in comparison to the universe? And you know, we are really terrible astronomers. We tend to think that we're the center of things and we're a really big deal. You start stargazing, you start putting your eye on a telescope, you you start looking through the instruments that scientists have used to help us see the universe around us. And you realize we're we're not really the center of everything and, and we're not really big. David knew better. In our day, we have tools to get more precise about our smallness. If we imagine the earth to be the size of a period, a punctuation mark, a human is 7.5 million times smaller than that. So imagine the earth as that period at the end of a sentence And your frame, 7.5 million times smaller than that, the sun would be a billiard ball. And our solar system would be four football fields across. And our galaxy would be 29,000 miles across. With the earth the size of a punctuation mark and the sun the size of a billiard ball. And then there are vast amounts of galaxies beyond ours, separated by vast black spaces with distances so large that numbers cease to make sense. We are not just small. We are infinitesimally small. Statistically nearly non-existent. Now we're not just small, we're also puny. What is man? We're mortal. And we are weak. When natural disasters hit, we learn very quickly that our humanity is easily defeated by a tsunami. Or consumed by a wildfire. Or crushed by an avalanche. Or trampled by a, trampled, trampled by a rhinoceros. Mauled by dogs. Every year in Arizona, somebody is killed. By, stung to death by a swarm of Africanized honeybees. I can't think of a worse way to go. We are, in fact, susceptible to just about everything around us. Giant animals or to germs and tiny microbes. Cancers or genetic entropy. And In fact, the whole human genome is collapsing with each successive generation. The human constitution is falling apart. And our weakness is evidenced by the myriad ways that we puny humans go out of this world. The first word for man in verse 4, what is man that you remember him? What is the son of man that you care for him? The first word for man just means ordinary. It is the the normal use for the word human. And the second word for man means dirt. The the name Adam comes from Edama, which means dirt or soil. And you remember that God took Adam out of the dirt and he said, to dirt you will return. Adam, you're dirt. That's what you are. That is the word that is used in verse 4. And yet we get this question, what is man, what is this ordinary being in this vast universe that you remember him? What is this son of dirt that you care for him? These poetic parallels bring out a a striking question. We humans somehow evoke the attention and compassion of God. Dirt we may be. An imperceptible grain of sand in an endless sea, but loved, cared for, 
Remember back to verse 2. This is sung to Yahweh our Lord. We, we have him and, and he has us. He's paying attention to us. Of all the vast reaches of the universe, God pays attention to your life. This phrase, son of man, is, is interesting. Son of man is the title that Jesus used most for himself. And I believe the title that, that Jesus most often called himself comes from Psalm 8 and Daniel 7.13. In Psalm 8, this is a reference to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Daniel 7.13, the Son of Man was the holy divine being that shows up in the very throne room of God and is sent to humanity. The Son of Man title there refers to Jesus' deity. In fact, when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, highlighting both his humanity and his divinity, it is interesting that he uses the definite article. He is the Son of Man. That's different than just saying, oh yeah, there goes a guy that's a son of a man. Well, yeah, who isn't? But when he says he is the son of man, he is pointing to the, the, de- the deity, the figure in Daniel 7.13, the, the one who is God who would take on flesh. And he's pointing to the ideal of humanity here in Psalm 8. This will become important for us in the way that the rest of the Bible uses this psalm. We understand here in this text that God gets glory in the smallness of man. Compared to the universe, humanity is puny. But God cares and he uses weak things to accomplish weighty, glorious realities. In this psalm, we discover that God also will get glory in humanity's regal role. That is, he has a job to do. A job as king. Look at verse 5. Yet... You have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You may be looking down at your Bible, and, and some translations have, you, may, you have made him a little lower than angels. And, and the reason for that is, the word Elohim is the word that's used there. And it can be used of the one true God. It's a word that can be used of false gods. And in a couple places, it's used either of a human judge or of angelic beings. And there is a passage in the New Testament which takes this verse and uses the word angels in this place. Uh, There's a a long reason for that. And someday when we get to the book of Hebrews, uh, we'll talk through the details of that. But I believe this verse is a reflection, not forward to Hebrews 2, but backward to Genesis 1, 26. Where man is said to be made in the image of God. I think God is the appropriate translation here. And man is said to be a little lower than God. Now that doesn't mean just a tiny bit smaller than infinite in size. That's not what he means. A little lower than God means a little lower in status or rank in the created order. Man was made last during creation week. Humanity was the pinnacle of God's creation. We'll talk about why in a moment. But notice this verse says, you have crowned him There's a a royal term with glory and with majesty. God is the one that is peerless in his glory. The glory that he doesn't share with anybody is the glory that belongs only to himself. And yet he gives glory in this way to humanity. God has crowned humanity with glory and with majesty. There is a a radiance to humanity by God's design that sets man apart from everything else. And there is a majesty, a regal royalty to humanity that's important to who we are. You see, the glory of humanity is being made in the image of God. The majesty of humanity, his royal status, is humanity's role as king over the creation. Man was originally designed to be sub-regent under God over the earth. He was to reflect God. And so dirt we may be, specks of dirt, but we are royal dirt, glorious, majestic, purposeful dirt. You see, Psalm 8 is a commentary on Genesis chapter 1. 
Turn back there, if you will. Genesis chapter 1. Again, this is the, the week of creation and the ending of that week as the last act of creation. Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. The us and the our there is Trinitarian relationships. That's not God and some bystanders. That's not God and somebody else. That's not a sort of royal plural pronoun. Uh, that is Trinitarian relationship. God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And you notice the pronouns there. Who are the image bearers of God? Not just Adam, the first man, but all of humanity, them, and male and female, them. Then God said, behold, I have given to you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth. Every tree which has the fruit of the tree yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the sky, to everything that creeps on the earth and has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so and notice verse 28, God blessed them. He said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Put the kibosh on it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. All of that language shows up here in Psalm 8. Look at verse 6. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, sheep and oxen, animals of the field, the birds of the heavens, fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. The whole rest of this psalm picks up the language of Genesis 1, 26 to 28 and highlights humanity's role. Man is to be a king with subjects. In the garden, the animals lined up to be named by Adam. That was an expression of his dominion. You name something, you own it. The garden yielded its produce. The earth yielded its resources. There was to be a happy symbiosis between God's world and the steward of God's world. The, the manager, the, the lord of the earth. Humanity. That was to be a relationship over the earth of lordship and leadership and selfless love. Look at verse 7. All the sheep, all the oxen, the animals of the field. This is the sheep and the cattle. The, the second word there is for domesticated and work animals. And then he describes the beasts of the field or the animals of the field. Sometimes the word for beast is used to describe cattle. But in contrast here in this verse, it describes the, the beast out there in the open. The wild animals. A man was to have dominion over all of this. The relationship between humanity and his environment was one to be of responsible and accountable stewardship. This is God's world and man is to take care of it, to be in charge of it. The Psalm 8 takes us back to Genesis 1 and the pre-fall world. The song that David is singing is, is a song reflecting the ideal before the fall. But Psalm 8 also takes us to a future world. It, it fast forwards us in anticipation to a liberated world. A cosmos that will be liberated from the shackles of the fall. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Psalm 8 does not perfectly describe what we experience right now. But it does describe what was supposed to be and what will be. Look at Romans 8, 18. I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There's a glory coming right now, suffering. For the anxious longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Their creation itself is personified. 
like a long necked bird peering around the corner, anxiously looking for the coming of something. What is that coming? The revelation of the sons of God. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, frustration, vanity, not willingly, but because of God who subjected it in hope. What is that hope? What is that hope that creation itself personified is looking forward to? That hope is the freedom from slavery to corruption in the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Creation right now is enslaved to corruption. Things fall apart. Second law of thermodynamics. It's all breaking down. Stuff dies. Stuff breaks. Stuff rusts and stuff rots. All of that is a result of the curse from God because of the fall of humanity, the Lord over creation. And when the Lords over creation are what they were supposed to be, creation gets set free from its slavery to corruption, from its futility, from its spinning around in vanity. There is freedom coming for the universe when God's people look like Jesus. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Not only this, but we ourselves groan, eagerly waiting for our adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. The world gets freed into what it was supposed to be when man gets freed into what he was supposed to be. In a frustrated creation... You and I have to be careful about trying to exercise humanity's rightful dominion. If you take Genesis 126, you read the song about it, the commentary in Psalm 8, and you think, great, I've got dominion. Uh, I'm going to go tell a Bengal tiger or a tiger shark what to do. Good luck with that. You will likely be eaten. Long before they submit to your lordship, the creation does not yet yield to the original design. There are weeds, there are mosquitoes, the dog bites, the bee stings, there is mayonnaise. We're under the curse. I love Jack London's short stories. He wrote a story called To Build a Fire. Did you ever read that story? This is the story about man against nature. And, and man with all his ingenuity, with all of his genius, with all of his planning and his backup planning, he's going to conquer. And this man uh, heads out into the wilderness and it's colder than 50 below zero. And he's there with his dog and he's going to get from point A to point B. And he falls into the river and his feet are cold and he's got to get himself out of there. And all he has to do is build a fire and warm up his feet, put his boots back on and he'll be on his way. He'll be just fine because man is that good. And of course, he succeeds in building a fire, thawing out his clothes and thawing out his feet. And and the fire was underneath a tree that had boughs covered in snow. The snow melted and fell down onto the fire and put his fire out. And he froze and he died. And that's the end of the story. His dog makes it to the place he was going. But nature wins. Man is very small. And nature will revert to its unfrustrated state only when humanity returns to its unfallen state. In the meantime, nature is a beast that will eat us alive. Some would see a dominion mandate in Genesis 126 or in Psalm 8. You have to go out there and, and conquer it because the Bible says so. Well, the Bible says that's what man was supposed to be. And the Bible indicates that is what man will be. But I don't think these things give us license to go dominate the creation any way we see fit. Psalm 8 poetically portrays the ideal, but the tensions in this world force us to reckon with the fact we do not live in that ideal yet. Man is rightfully Lord over the creation. But look at the broken state of that relationship. When man exercises his lordship, In his rebellion against the Lord, he exercises it in laziness or in selfishness. He's a bad steward of his environment. He takes his role over the created order and serves self. The creation groans under the strain. The ground yields thorns and thistles. 
And by the sweat of his face, man can eke his bread out of the ground. We, we live and work to survive, but we're working against a world that's working against us. Turn to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 portrays the tension that Saul made is singing the ideal, but it is not yet realized. In Hebrews 2, the author quotes Psalm 8 to make that very point. Look at verse 5. God did not subject to angels the world to come. There we, we start to see the hierarchy we were talking about before. Angels are not the highest in the pecking order. Underneath God, man is a little lower. Man is ranked higher than angels in God's economy in the long run. He doesn't subject angel, uh, the world to come to angels. But one said somewhere, and here he's quoting David in Psalm 8, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you're concerned about him? You've made him for a little while lower than the angels. And, and here the writer to Hebrew is now comparing uh, not only humanity to angels, but Jesus to angels. That's why he makes the change. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You've appointed him over the works of your hands. You put all things in subjection under his feet. There he's singing Psalm 8. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to man. There's that tension. There's the ideal. This is what man was made for. This is what the world's supposed to be in relationship to him. But it's not that way yet. Look at Psalm 8, 8. The birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever pass, passes through the paths of the sea... Wild animals, domesticated animals, birds, and sea creatures, all of it. This is to include all of the created order. By the way, in the Old Testament way of thinking, the, the Hebrew way of thinking, vegetative life was not considered life. We think of broccoli as life, uh, but it doesn't have the breath of life in, in the Hebrew way of thinking. This idea that man was to fill the earth and subdue it, was God's design to fill the entire earth with people that looked like him. Back to Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image, with our imprint, with our stamp, and let him fill the earth and let him rule it. This gives us an idea of what the image of God in man is. It is a lordship, a leadership. It is a, a self-emptying service of love. Theologians have spilled a lot of ink tracing out the image of God in man. First time it shows up is in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image. It comes again in Genesis 2.24 when Adam has a son in his image. And then you get to Genesis chapter 9 and the image is mentioned again. This is after the fall, and God says, do not murder. If you murder, capital punishment is the appropriate response. Why? Because man is made in God's image. That means that even after the fall, when men walk the earth, they are still image bearers of God. Now, John Calvin said that the image of God in man is not removed after the fall, although what remains is frightful deformity. When we look at each other and we're looking for what is God like and we look in each other's faces, we're having, a, we're having a hard time seeing with clarity. There is a disrupting of the image of God in man. And then you don't get any other mention of the image of God in man in the Old Testament. You're just left thinking, well, what is it? What is the image of God in man? And theologians have, by process of elimination, tried to logic this out. And they've, they've made the argument this way. Well, what is the image of God in man? It must be that which makes man different than everything else. Uh, maybe it's communication. Um, man can talk. Broccoli can't. Dolphins kind of can. Chirping noises. Maybe they say more than we think they do. But the problem with that is angels also communicate. And they're not made in the image of God. So the image of God in man is not the ability to communicate. And people go through all kinds of lists of attributes of humanity trying to sort out what is the image of God. And I believe the Bible actually tells us what it is. 
We come to the New Testament, and I grant there's a, there's a whole lot of Old Testament silence. It's just stated, man is made in God's image with not a lot of explanation of what that is. And, and there's this tension. We're just waiting. What is the image of God in man? Listen to John 1, 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, that's Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. When Jesus came to the earth, he is described as the only begotten God who explains the Father. That's a clue. Turn to Colossians 1.15. If you had read your Bible from left to right, from Genesis 1, all the way through the, the redemptive plan of God laid out in the whole Bible, and you were asking the question, what is the image of God in man? And you came to Colossians 1.15, you would have a striking answer. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus the man is the image of the invisible God. What is the image of God in man? Jesus. He, he's the ideal sinless man who actually is the image of God. Building on John 1.18, he is the explanation of the Father. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Jesus, the Son, is said to be the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His nature. He is the one who actually represents who God is, the, the image or the likeness of God. Turn back to Colossians. In chapter 3, verse 10, we discover that in the Christian life, something is happening with this word image. We put on the new man who is being renewed to a full knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. What's going on there? Now this image of God and man has moved from Jesus, the perfect man who is the image of God in a man, bringing people to himself through the gospel and transforming their image. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us that we are being renewed from one glory to another into the image of Jesus by the Lord, the Spirit. And in Romans chapter 8, that passage we looked at earlier where the creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. What is it the sons of God will be revealed as? According to Romans 8.29, conformity to the image of of Jesus. In other words, creation is set free from its corruption when you and I look like Christ. What is the image of God in a man? You see it in Jesus. How does Jesus display the Father? Well, he's Lord. He's a servant leader and he empties himself in love. His lording leadership over the universe is a rulership of love. Not domineering, not laziness, but selflessness. This self-emptying love is, is the image of God in the man Christ. And it is the image he is taking all of his followers into. All of this leads back to verse 9 of Psalm 8. Back to the bookend. O oh, Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory on display in all the earth. Your glory in splendor above the heavens. And then your glory in using the, the dirt specks for majestic and glorious purposes. This psalm we will be fulfilled in its fullness. When the earth is filled with the glory of the Lord through redeemed image bearers. Who are no longer marring the image but act as the reflectors of the glory and majesty of God in a renewed creation as per the original design. That's where all of this is headed. In fact, Hebrews 2, we, we left off, but in verse 9 and 10 of Hebrews 2, 
we discover that while humanity does not yet have the created order under his foot, Jesus became man and came and suffered with us in order to perfect us unto that end. Jesus is the God-man and the second Adam who restores what is marred to its original intent, only better. What Adam lost will never be losable in the second iteration. There's another way that, that our glorification is better than Adam's original sinlessness. Adam knew perfect fellowship with God. He knew the symbiotic relationship to an unfallen world. He knew a perfect marriage for a few minutes or however long it was. But now, after the fall and after redemption, we have access to things Adam didn't have then. And we will have them for all of eternity. We will know what it means to be sinners and to be forgiven. We will have experiential knowledge of evil and the contrast to the experiential knowledge of perfect good. And we will know the attributes of God that would not have been known apart from sin and the fall and redemption. Grace, mercy, his love of the unlovely, his patience with us while we were in rebellion against him. All of these things we get to know personally through this plan. Let me give you two quick takeaways. Number one, you were created to rule creation. Don't fall into the environmentalist trap that says humans are dispensable and mother earth must last. This earth is going away by fire. Humanity lives forever and every single human being is made in the image of God and exists forever and will do so either in God's glory saved by grace through the gospel or under judgment forever for remaining in rebellion against him. Humanity is very important to God, not on a level with creation, but has a very specific and regal role. You won't live up to that design unless and until you surrender to the designer. So if you're here tonight and you don't know why you exist, you need to know Jesus. That's the bottom line. Takeaway number two, God gets glory using weak instruments. He will use puny man to rule the universe. Psalm 8 identifies the little children who will glorify God through simple faith. And when God was on the earth, he, he identified that very praise that he ordained from them to silence the powerful and the strong, the adversaries. Just know that if you feel weak, you're in a good spot. If you feel small against a dark world, God uses the weak things to shame the powerful. He uses the simple things to shame the wise. And when you and I walk out of here with a simple gospel, God loves sinners and he forgives all who will come to him in faith. There is no power. There is no smarts. There is no strength. There is no so-called wisdom of the world that can beat that. And we just believe him and we walk out with that good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this song. And we pray that it would resonate in our hearts, that we would indeed live up to the reason that you made us. And we have rebelled against that. And you are gracious to save rebels who will turn to you in faith. And we thank you for the promise that we will one day live as you designed. And we long for that day. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let us be useful to you in this mixed up, cursed, and broken world until you do. Amen.